We got some exciting folks coming to the stage, right? Some iconic energy in the room, right? All this iconic energy we've had in the room today. So first off, I want to introduce someone as my co-facilitator because when you facilitate with icons, you got to make sure you're well equipped, right? You know what I mean? You got to make sure you have a team with you, right? And so I'm so excited to invite up on the stage a really beautiful and powerful member of Beam's team. She's one of our long-term trainers. She's a poet and a teaching artist. She does a lot of our groups around heart space, holding space for black women, black men to heal. Y'all give a round of applause for Natalie Patterson to join the page, join the stage. Come on up, come on up. And she cute, she, she rocking this pink. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Hello. Hi, hi. How y'all doing? doing? Okay, so here's what I need y'all to do. Don't be cute in person, not making no noise, not talking back. I need all the vibes and all the energy. I know we live streaming for the people at home, but I need all the energy right here because we got a legend coming up. We don't get to do that every day. So let's have all the love, all the vibes, all the energy. Is that all right? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, this legend is so epic. Let me tell you, I was talking about how, like, I told my family. I was, I think, I was like telling my family I had something that happened at the house. Like, yeah, something's going on with the house. The water is, is flooding the house. They ain't got no attention, pay no attention. I said, oh, you know, Miss Debbie Allen is coming. Miss Debbie Allen, what you doing with Debbie Allen? I was like, whoa, calm down. Like, my family has been so ecstatic and I think so I'm, excited. I'm, I'm definitely Everybody. on favorite child status right now. <laughs> so it's a great Sunday in Los Angeles. Yeah. So before Miss Allen comes up, do you want to tell us a little bit about who? who let's give a people even a glimpse. Of the brilliance of who she is, Miss? The brilliance of who Miss Debbie Allen is. Yeah. I think first we need to check in. Okay, let's check in. Because how you check you in. just did a whole panel. Yeah, I did. Dynamic energy. How are you doing? You know, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling grateful. I'm feeling honored to be a part of this movement, this space that is really bringing these conversations to the forefront, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's really a blessing. I feel in alignment. I feel my grandmother here. I feel my Auntie Pumpkin here. And yeah, I'm not gonna start crying, y'all. But I'm just really grateful for all of you all for also being a part of this. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Wonderful. Um, well, I'm just delighted to be here. Y'all look beautiful. It's a beautiful, warm day in LA. Some of other places in the country, they don't have the sun. You know, it's a weird vibe. I'd be like, you got to move to LA so you can have some sun. Um, so I'm just really grateful to be here. Gra glad to see such beautiful people. And of course, we have an incredible legend among us. And so I'd love to tell you a little bit about her. If you don't know, we gonna let you know, okay? Um, Miss Debbie Allen is synonymous really with creative energy, right? With brilliance, with being a legend and an icon, right? Um, for many of us, if you're in your 30s, you have seen her career since your inception, right? She was a vibe, a thing, moving around, doing all of these brilliant things, being on television um, and also film and, and behind the camera and all of these different things. What you may not know, right, is um, she also has won three Emmys, a Golden Globe, five NAACP awards, a Drama Desk, a St an Astaire Award for Best Dance, a Television Academy 2021 Governor's Award, a Kennedy Center honoree, four doctoral degrees, has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and was appointed by former President George W. Bush as a cultural ambassador for dance for the United States. You know what I'm saying? Like, just all the things, all the areas, all the things. And we'll continue to do amazing, incredible things that we get to watch. YOLO, Ooh. tell them about TV, about yes. stage. About dance, so much. So, Miss Allen's work on TV and film has really changed and shifted the culture, right? There are conversations that we are having that, we, that, that we're, she was responsible for cultivating and making space for, without doubt. Uh, some of her directing and producing credits include, I don't know if y'all, I remember Fame, y'all remember Fame? Yeah. Of course, Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, Jane the Virgin, Empire, a different world, y'all. Y'all know yeah. what I'm talking about, right? Um, she is also currently the executive producer, director, and, act, and an actress. She also stars on it on ABC's Grey's Anatomy. So many different roles. And I think it's also important to lift up what Debbie, Ms. Matt Allen has done for the um, uh, Los Angeles community, particularly Absolutely. around dance, right? The Debbie Allen Dance Academy, which has a new center donated by Shonda Rhimes. Y'all might have saw it in the news, right? So I think it's just really important when we were thinking about who could be a person to have this conversation with around body and movement and dance as a critical canon for wellness and mental health, we knew that Miss Debbie Allen was a great person for that conversation. And so we're just thrilled and honored to have her as a part of this. And we want to invite her to the stage. Miss Debbie Allen, please come up and join us. Y'all give a round up. Come on, stand up. Round of applause. Come on. I'm, I'm behind you. 
Am I right here? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the love. Thank you so much for being with us today. Nice to be I see y'all got the umbrellas out. Thank you for this. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. We're we, just like, we're not going to get sunburned no. and have a conversation. <laughs> no, I can, I can use a little toast right now. <laughs> so, Ms. Allen, how are you feeling today? This is the check-in. Like, we're grateful to have you here. Oh. How are you feeling as our just initial just check-in? What's going on? I feel great. I woke up with my two grandchildren, oh. Avian, Shiloh, got them dressed, had breakfast. Had a meeting with Dolly Parton about her new movie. Oh, wow. Went to the dance studio, and uh, we had two classes, Tavares Wilson and Miss Abby Lee okay. from Dance Moms. Took a little girl to the bathroom, had an anxiety attack. <laughs> had to calm her down, and now I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my day. Yeah. I mean, you asked. Just telling you the truth. Just talking to Dolly Parton, you know, yeah, like, <laughs> just cash. No, we did a movie together before, Wonderful. and she's got another Christmas movie she wants me to help her with. So love that. I'm trying. That's Wonderful. amazing. Well, I think it's important that, um, speaking of the Dance Academy, I think it's really important that we just kind of acknowledge a big achievement, a big achievement for you. Folks who don't know, you know, the Shonda Rhimes, who's been a great friend of Beam, donated the new center to Debbie Allen Middle School of the Performing Arts. So congratulations to yeah, that. Yeah, this has been a, quite an undertaking. Shonda Rhimes bought the building and the land, and then we started raising money to raise this cultural center. Wallace Annenberg, who has been our principal sponsor for over 15 years, is the first one to donate a big chunk of money to making sure that it got done. Kobe Bryant donated money before he died. And we had a lot of plans. There's a lot of people involved here. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation has worked closely with us. Um, so this is really um, a center, an oasis, I call it, for creativity and a safe haven for young people, elders. I mean, we're going to talk about all the stuff I do with dance to help people live a better quality of life. Uh, but it's something we need. And uh, a building doesn't make a center, it's the people. So right now, it's about the people that are invested mm -hmm. in our young people's lives, our elders' lives, our people that need help lives. You know what was great today was um, I was breezing around and they said, Miss Allen, look at the front door. There was a policeman there. I said, officer. He said, no, I just wanted to see what was going on. I said, well, honey, come on inside. Come on in. So the policeman. They parked their car, and they came in fully, you know, ready to do whatever. And they were loving watching those kids dance. Mm. And I stopped the class to introduce them. Because, you know, we got to look at everybody with more than one lens. You know, so this was a brother and a Latin brother. It was really nice. So they, we're on their beat, and I want them to bring their children, you know. It's the kind of world I'm living in. That's all I'm just sharing. Yeah, no, I love that. That's so beautiful. Let's, let's start where you've already brought us to, dance. Yeah. Right? You are a legendary choreographer, dan like has been, have been leading this dance space for so long. And it's one of the things, funny memories I remember from the quarantine, um, early, early days of COVID-19, I remember you would have the Instagram live where you would have the dances. And I had my, my, and my mom and my aunties, we were all like, oh, Miss Bailey doing the dance, are you gonna do it? I'm like, yes, mom, I'm gonna watch it, okay. Like, it was a whole thing. You, and so you were really centering in that moment. For me, it felt like what you've always done, which is show that how dance and movement can be a source of healing and wellness. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, well, you know, the pandemic shut us all down. And I remember that day because I shut down Grey's Anatomy and the Dance Academy on the same day. Mm. And, you know, dancers, you know, we're gypsies. We don't have no insurance. Ain't nobody thinking. Okay. You know, we do. We're the spectacle, the day, deus ex machina, which is what we call in the theater, the excitement of a production. But we're the least paid. And um, I knew what's going to happen to my staff, what's going to happen to my kids. Mm. So I said, okay, we're shutting down, but we're not. I said, we're going to do Instagram classes on Instagram. They said, how are we going to do that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Y'all, the young ones, figure it out. But I'm having class next, next Wednesday. Oh, wow. So I started. And, you know, when much is asked, it's when you come up with it. Creativity comes out of 
you know, not being able to have all the money. You get more creative. And so we had the first class, and we had 35,000 people in my class. Ooh. And they were from Brazil and Germany and Russia and China, Southeast Asia. Wow. So where we were shut down connecting like this, we were open to another world. Yeah. So I kept that class going, and then I had people complaining, well, you, why is it free? I'm like, baby, <laughs> baby. <laughs> you know, this ain't a time to make money. It's time to make a difference. Mm -hmm. OK, now. All right, now. So All right, now. some studios were complaining that you're giving classes free and that's hurting us. I said, look, honey, do your thing. I'm trying to help the people. Baby, do your Come thing. Come on now. That's do the your word. thing. That's I'm not hurting word. you. So it turned into a wonderful thing. And other studios started following and, and, and making it really reasonable. And then, you know, finally we put up a donate sign if people want to. I mean, one woman donated uh, like $25,000. Wow. And it was like, what? Oh, that was great. You, we needed that money, but it wasn't, you know. Yeah. It's like you do it and it comes back. Yeah. It's how it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. if your hand is closed, come you can't on. get it. <laughs> you know, so if you're going like that, yeah. something might come back. Yeah. Right. So we've been doing that and we started also doing classes um, for the hospital workers, every Friday, I taught some of the classes as much as I could, and we would go into the hospitals with some of the most critically ill patients, young people in particular, and we did dance classes. For, it, it was not streamed, it went right to the hospital. Wow. And we had started a class already called Journey of Yourself. I started with Dr. Uh, Perot, Lawrence Perot, who's a great oncologist, world famous oncologist, cancer patients. So dance, it was one of the most exciting dynamic classes I ever did teach to teach various patients in various different stages of, you know, diagnosis, treatment, survival or not of cancer. I had like 50 people who some of them from the age of maybe 17 to 75 who never thought they could move again. Mm -hmm. And this dance, I found ways to connect them to believe that there was some help coming for them somewhere. And I started talking to them about sweating holy water. Mm -hmm. I need that holy water coming because this is the divine thing. It's a spiritual thing to dance. Wow. It is, wow. it is. And so we just found ourselves in a whole nother world doing those classes. And then I have another class called um, Calibri Arts for the Elders. Child, that's the most fun class from 60 to 95 year olds, tap dancing, doing African dance. I put them in the recital one year. They were just too cute. And so COVID shut a lot of that down. So then we went and filmed videos and gave them to me. We just gave them. And so now we're back with the help of, you know, certainly the Rhymes Performing Arts and Shonda and Wallace Sandenberg and all the people that are helping us, we now can open up again. We have a beautiful space, but it's meant to be a community space. So that's how I'm using it. And, um, you know, dance is the original art, if you ask me. Now, I know I'm a little biased, but I'm going to say shit. You know, before man could draw, didn't have a pencil, didn't know how to sing in tune, they were stamping on the ground, mm. jumping, twirling, you know, in homage to birth, to death, mm. for rain, for harvest, for whatever. It's just historically the most original, you know, yeah. art form. And it is a language. It's a dance is a language, which is why we can go all over the world where people are going through whatever they're going through. I went to China one time. I didn't know what it was going to be like. Child, they were going like this. They had, they were like, had their own MTV channel. They were like, I was tat, tatted up. I'm like, okay, child, let's go. <laughs> I was in the Middle East where, you know, I was actually scared to go at first. I'm gonna be honest. There's a man named Osama kept calling. I'm like, hell, I'm not going nowhere with nobody named Osama, no. <laughs> But he turned out to be a wonderful human being, and he challenged me, and I went over there. 
And um, I will never forget being in a museum. Anytime I go to a country, I go to the museum. I want to see what their culture is. I go to the library, the museums. Tell a man with one of those AK-40, whatever you call them, with the red dot following us around the museum. I had my assistant, Dion. Dion Watson was with me. The man was following us through the museum. I said, God damn it, we getting rid of these. They're going to take us. Well, I ain't got no money with my hell. Call Colin Powell. Somebody call Colin Powell. Uh, then I realized Dion was dancing the whole time. He was just popping through the museum. And the, the guy was like, he put the rifle down. I'm not making this up. He put the rifle down and we started clapping his hand. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who danced like you. I'm like, yeah, keep dancing, child. <laughs> we say that. Keep dancing. And we, we met him at a club. We, I said, OK, we either getting ready to get killed or we getting ready to have a real cultural experience. Mm -hmm. We went in there. They had people break dancing harder than anything I'd ever seen. They learned it on the internet. Yep. And I was there to do a show. And I was going, I said, what's your name, baby? OK, you coming tomorrow. You. Yes, you. Uh-huh, you. And I found a whole nother beautiful group of people. And it was the language of the dance. Mm. It was the, the language of the dance that united us, that connected us, that made him put his rifle down. Mm. Now, if we could get some of that going on over there over in Ukraine. Mm. No, let's talk about Ukraine. Come on, let's be real. There's children running for their lives like that. I know we're being hunted, but that is ridiculous, what's happening over there. And we're standing and not doing enough. I don't know. It frightens me. Because I have grandchildren, and I see little babies being running, groups of them running. For, it, I don't know. It frightens me. Yeah, yeah. And we have our own, yes, our own to deal with. Yeah. But um, the world is in chaos, and what do we do to bring more light in? Well, all I can do is dance and do what I do and tell good stories and try to bring truth and communication. Uh, television is most powerful. It's powerful. So powerful. It is so powerful. You know, I know all the TikTok and all like that is cute. But <laughs> those television shows make people stop and think if you're telling a story mm -hmm. that they need to hear, they need to know about. And there's some wonderful documentaries happening. And so I feel like I'm in a world that is making a difference. Absolutely. I am in a world that uh, is challenged by business, but can make a difference. I mean, look at uh, Shonda Rhimes took Bridgerton and took it and made it something totally creative, took it out of the book and lifted it up into something else. You know, the people down there in North Carolina, they're scared. They didn't know Charlotte was black. They're nervous down there now. Yeah. You know, they're going to look up and have a little brown baby and not go, well, how did that happen? It's in your DNA, baby. Ooh. It's in the DNA all the way, all the way. I know you all heard about that woman in Africa, white woman had a black baby and they were trying to figure it out. Yeah. It's in your DNA. Like, you know where you are. You are right, on right. the continent. That's how it happens. It's you your know, family. And I'm trying to make people understand. After I did a movie called Amistad that Steven Spielberg yes. directed. Yes. See, it took me 18 years. Ooh, child. That was like going to the cross almost. Dedication. It was. Dedication. Yeah, you got to believe and you can't be scared because everybody's like hating on you, whatever. They want me to keep singing and dancing. They didn't want to me to be thinking and mm. talking about something that's a little painful but real. Mm -hmm. You know, all this stuff about not telling the truth in history books. What's wrong with folks? What is wrong with people? Anyway, <laughs> I'm going back and forth and moving all around. No, we love it. We love it. We love it. Just speaking truth. But, you know, um, that movie, ooh, it took 18 years to get it done. But we still jumped ahead of the history books because it wasn't in the books. Right. The story wasn't being told. I know, because I was a really good student in history. And I grew up in Texas. Oh, Lord, have mercy, Texas. I know, child. <laughs> I didn't do it. Don't come for me. I know it's my home state. But 
It was important. And so one person can have an idea. That was what's strong about that movie. It starts with him pulling that nail, that one nail changed the course of yep. those African captives and the Supreme Court yep. who had the courage at that time to do a decision that was right. Not just going with some foolishness. They, dis they discerned that these were African captives. They were human. Therefore, they needed to be sent back home. Mm -hmm. Where was that story in our history books? Yeah. Yeah. The Supreme Court right now needs to go look at that movie, child. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to do a movie night for the Supreme Court okay. so we can just get some so things together. I know. We're in trouble. We're in trouble a lot of ways. But anyway, I'm talking too much. Ask a question. No, you know, it's great. I want to. Those are all great. You, you brought us so much wisdom across so many things. Like, one, just upholding the piece you shared about dance as the universal language. Yes. Like, you know, the ways in which it, the ability of dance to help de-escalate in that situation. You said he put his mm -hmm. gun down. He was, the ways in which you go across cultures across the world and you see folks doing tap and ballet and hip hop and you also see the stanky leg and all the dances <laughs> across the world. Yes. And how we use dance as a way to, like, you, like when, during the um, pandemic particularly, when you doing that provided a space for people to process things that were really difficult to process. Yes. We were able to get on the dance floor in our living rooms <laughs> or in the backyards or wherever we could to process and dance is so critical for our healing and wellness so i just love all those pieces you brought together even bring into amistad which is such a powerful part of our history right that needs to be acknowledged and uplifted but also once again speaks to the things that we hold that have not been brought to the forefront that are still in our dna in our genes in our memories that sometimes even dance and art can help us cultivate and bring out before the schools do or before the Supreme Court gets on board. You know what I mean? So just We can't wait for, for them, honey. Yeah, there you go. So we have to be passing this around, which is why in our culture, the African griot, there was always storytelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You made sure you told the story. You know, I'm going to talk to my grandchildren. I'm going to tell them the truth. Mm. I'm going to tell them. It's why I started writing books. I'll never forget when Vivian and Thump, my children, that I birthed were little, and I couldn't find books where they were the leading characters. So I said, I got to write something. Because I was reading a book one time about Egypt, right? And I was reading it to them in, you know, Egypt and the Nile and the ancient pyramids, and they were this and that, and they were, I had to stop reading and said, they were, but they were white. I had to stop, I went, but they were, mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to do some edits on this story real quick. What, how could, this was a book. This was a children's book. Mm. So we have to make sure that we are getting a, I want to say, I don't want to say encyclopedic, but a wide view of what is going on in the world and what is true. Mm. Because truth is now, I'm, I'm not sure. It is just so subjective. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, is, it, is the sky blue or is it purple? You know, that sky is purple. You know, somebody will say this and make it true, but it is not. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure we are doing this in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, that we are keeping our culture strong. That's what I learned when I did Amistad. I found, because I was determined to find as many African people that I could to play the parts. Mm -hmm. And I came upon, uh, upon an organization called Tagloma. Have any of you even heard of it? No. Tagloma is, hmm, I had never heard of it. And because I was looking and digging deep, it is the African, uh, you want to call it the African NAACP mm. here in America where they keep their culture pure, where they meet and they talk. And this is intertribal. This is not one group because, you know, I see where the gang warfare comes from. The tribalism, tribalism is serious. Ooh, child is serious. But Tagloma, I met so many hundreds and hundreds of people who were professional people who left their jobs to come and be an extra in the movie Amistad because it was important. Wow. Pharmacists, teachers, dental technicians, nurse, I'm telling you, Tagloma. Mm. It was amazing wow. that that 
keeping their culture pure because there was a man, the real raider of the Lost Ark is a man named S. Allen Counter. Allen Counter was a Harvard professor. We lost Allen a few years ago. But he went down to the Suriname, down in South America. And he's the, one of the first black men to be in the Explorers Club, mm. which is, you know, those, they're some beasts, child. They go and climb the highest mountain to pick a flower, the only flower that grows, just to say they did it. Mm -hmm. Or deep down in the ocean, to, to just to pick a shell, I did it. You know, it's like that, with they're like another breed of human being. Alan was such a person. And Alan went down to the Suriname, going up a river, trying to do some research on mercury and hearing, and he saw somebody behind a tree with the blackest face he'd ever seen. And he was like, wait a minute, what, what, what? And they r turned around. He found the, uh, uh, in the rainforest, living in the rainforest, a more pure existence of African people from the time of slavery who fled and went into the rainforest, wow. didn't even know they were no longer in Africa. Wow. This is a true story. I've been trying to tell this story for every child. They, <laughs> don't, don't start. We can't wait it's to coming, watch it. It's coming, don't it's start. coming. No, I can't do another 18 years, y'all. Time, <laughs> time is getting, it's getting short now. I'm at the top of the seventh. Okay, well, I'm glad you bottom. told us maybe someone here. Well, like we can talk, let's list. take it. I'm just telling you. So. We have history and we have stories and we have truths and we have more to discover because history is not something to be memorized. It's something to continue to excavate and learn, Ooh. just like studying the Bible. The Bible is to be studied and learned. And when did God stop speaking? Who said that that's over, that the Bible is done? Mm. Who in here is getting that word? Let us not act as if things are so definitive. The world, the universe that we're living in is dancing. Oh, come This on is now. what the astrophysicists finally came to that understanding. Those that don't believe in God mm. start to understand that there is some measure of intelligence that this math is working, that this is the some something happening here that is not just chaos and by chance. It is by design. Come on now. And they started talking about the cosmic dance mm -hmm. in the universe, the planets colliding. Like what's going on in your body? This is your internal universe. Yeah. It's happening out here. So I don't know why I'm talking about that, but I'm just saying. It's, because it's, it's all connected. That's what we need to hear. Connected. That's what we need to hear. That's what it is. It's all connected. Um, so movement. Yes. If something isn't moving, it's dead. Mm. If it's not dancing, it's not living, honey. Mm. Right now, you sitting here, astral dust is penetrating your body. You can't see it, you can't feel it, but there is movement. Yeah. movement. This thing ain't what you think it is. Okay. It might oh, fall down. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll fall down and hurt you, but then what is solid in this world? What? We don't even understand yet. We're still coming into the age of real knowledge. You know, it's why I like those movies like Alien, Child, and Prometheus. I, I like love those movies, that. too. Oh, my God. I like all I of that. I love like all of that, child, because, you know, when you go back and look at those hieroglyphics and those yes. pyramids, it looks yes. like space people yes. everywhere. Yeah. You know, how did they build the pyramids over here in Mexico and over there yep. in Africa? That's right. Egypt is in Africa, God damn it. Yeah. Okay, thank you for saying that, because some people are so confused. Girl, don't make me get started. <laughs> But that's all a part of healing, the movement, the dance, of the universe, the like the sun. Like, you know, like, think about when I when you when I when you read um astrophysicists and they talk about like we're comprised of the same thing that is in the stars, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like what are you talking like it was just the connectedness of everything, right? Yes. But there's a way in which sometimes our culture pushes us to be away, disconnected from that rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. It pushes encourages us to like not honor that rhythm. And that's when we get out of our equilibrium, out of our wellness as a culture, as a collective, right? And dance is one of those languages is one of those strategies that can bring us back towards that. Can bring us back to it. And I think about emotion, right? Black people, we got all the emotions, mm. but not access to all of them, yes. right? And so sometimes we are doing things the way it's always been done because that's what we were taught. 
right, by imperfect legacies, really brilliant, wonderful people, right? But they ain't had TikTok when my grandma was alive. They didn't have all of this technology and how to manage it and what does it do to us over time, right? And I always think about there's these practices that our grandparents, that these folks we come from, they taught us passively. We saw our grandparents get in bathtubs and sit in that Epsom salt and chill out and tell everybody go mind their business somewhere else, right? We saw these not knowing that they were coping strategies, right? These were healing strategies. And how much of that are we continuing to do? I know there's, you know, the huge conversation around wellness, right, in our community. Mm. But how much of us, how many of us know that that's a spiritual practice? Yes, yes. Right, yes. that when we're in the world and we're navigating all of these different challenges, these life stressors, those are actually life stressors. That's not just like stuff that's happening to everybody. Those are things that deeply impact us and where do we have space to honor that and also continue to dance and move through the moment, yeah. right? To honor and move. Yeah. And sometimes we only do one or the other. Uh, well, that's a deep conversation. You know, I'm from Texas and you'd have to be Jeffrey Dahmer to get some help from a psychiatrist. Mm. It just was not acceptable. Not mm -hmm. You'd have to be crazy of getting ready to <laughs> jump off a roof or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And that it was and always it, a negative connotation. Right. Always, you know. So what is mental health? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is it? Mm -hmm. What is it? Mm -hmm. And and how do you help? And what are the signs? And yeah. how does movement help that? I mean, that's a whole conversation. Well, you know, it's an interesting conversation. Like, and I, we were talking a little bit back in the room about this, the, the, these pieces. You know, as somebody who is, I guess some of my colleagues would say, I am deeply moved, I don't know what, what pushes me to study the history of mental health or what we call now we call mental health, which is called mental hygiene, which different cultures have had very different understandings for. Mm -hmm. um, it's been fascinating to see that like what we now call bipolar or depression or schizophrenia has existed across the world and different folks Forever. have different names for it and different ways of relating to it, right? Mm -hmm. There are folks in, there are communities in Africa where someone who exhibits what we call schizophrenia was seen as a sage. And that was a channel for them to connect and they were grounded and supported in strategies to communicate visions, right? But that's not what happens in our, in our culture, in our world, right? Mm -hmm. But when we talk about mental health, um, you know, the, the way when we, we as being talk about it, we have, we have like, a couple of different things we got to honor. Like the mental health one is this relationship that one person has to their psychological and mental and mental well-being, right? So one is the relationship. When we talk about mental illness, which is something different. Mental health and mental illness are not the same thing. We're talking about all these different ways that people show up in cognitive or like, you know, um, in their nervous system in a certain kind of like distress. That, like, that cause them to be dysregulated in the ways in which they're able to engage or be in the world, right? And there are some people who would say that like, um, what we call mental illness is really just neurodiversity, which means that people will show up in different ways. How do we honor and support and ground them in how they show up in different ways? So for example, like, when we talk about an anxiety, for example, some folks will talk about anxiety. Many, I think about Dr. Bruce Perry's work. He has a really great book with Oprah called What Happened to You, which is a really powerful book I recommend everyone to read. He talks about how some of the things that we are talking, when we talk about people, um, trauma and all these different dimensions, it's about the dysregulation of the nervous system, of the brain in the different ways. And he talks about like those interventions, some of the interventions, yes, sometimes need to be medication, but some of the interventions he talked about when um, talking about indigenous healing, he said some of them are rhythm and healing and body movement. He said he's seen indigenous healers do more powerful work around mental health than he's seen people in these psychiatric care facilities. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that social support and connection is what most people need and to be seen, to be communed, to be validated, to be heard. Even with anxiety, someone having a panic attack, like in that moment, what is needed is someone to ground. Like you think about the strategies for somebody a panic attack, right? I think about This Is Us, which is a really good example of showing that. Like really sitting with you, breathe. I'm gonna breathe with you. I'm gonna get you back into a rhythm with your breath. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna maybe put my hands on your back or I'll let you sit, uh, put your back to a wall so you can feel grounded and rooted in this moment. I'm bringing you back into your body. I'm bringing you back into rhythm, right? And that is a part of what um, healing is. And what's, it's really interesting because in mental health, so many um, neuroscientists, these white men, are coming to this point saying, you know what, maybe African people and the indigenous Let's people take it back to know what they're talking about. about. Maybe we're going the wrong route. Dr. Bruce Perry, Thomas Insel, who's a former um, director of the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, they're all kind of like, wait a second. We've like, been saying this forever. Right, we've been, like, they're, and they're realizing that like, it is more than just, yes, there are some people who will need medication to stabilize, but what we often need is more care, more support, more community to help us really regulate ourselves and ground ourselves, and that looks like a lot of different things for different people. 
You know what I mean? So I just holding up those nuances because there is mental health is still, like you were saying earlier, when I look at mental health and I read some of these papers and articles, we're still learning a lot. We don't know a lot about mental health. We, we like, they, sometimes they present it like they know definitively, but th so there are a lot of scientists who were like, we don't really quite understand how schizophrenia impacts the brain, but we're learning. This is what we do know. We have some answers. And so as we're learning, the one thing that I see consistently is that social support, community, connection, and access to resources is one of the most important, powerful things for anybody, regardless of what your mental state is, you know? Absolutely. Well, I think it's, it also starts, again, with discussion. Yes. Right. If you don't talk about these things, they don't really exist. You know, for years, women had something called postpartum depression, and they just thought we were just acting out. Losing our minds. That's but, you know, when you push a baby out, yes. it's like you're losing your arm yeah. or your leg. You had a growing energy inside, yes. and that is a loss. Birth is a gain, but it's a loss. So your, your, your body's still reaching for it. And some women would just lose it because they were so imbalanced. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I remember my doctor telling me to breastfeed as long as possible because it would help bring everything back together. Mm. You know, women shy away from that sometimes. I remember when I was doing it, everybody wasn't doing it. They're doing it more now. It's like, if you're going to be in public, I said, hey, my baby's hungry, shut up. But this was a part of the healing process between us both. So, but we didn't talk about it. It was just women were, you know, crazy. So there's a lot that has to be discussed in our community that we don't talk about. We don't talk about it. I mean, we're not armed with enough information. You know, what are they teaching in school? You know, just like when they, all this math, why don't they teach children how to balance a checkbook? Or, okay, or pay a mortgage, or what it is to pay taxes. taxes you know, I don't want to be, I'm not going over here to space. Yeah. All I need was five, six, seven, eight, honey. That was it. <laughs> that was five, six. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to address this. I know we're talking with us as adults, but how does this start with our kids? Yeah. Because the onset of AIDS changed the playground for our kids. Mm. It changed it. Mm. They had to become adults overnight. Mm. They had to be educated about sex. They had to be educated about why they can't touch little Johnny if he bleeds. Mm. Well, why? Why, mommy? What is that? They had to learn. That, you know, we're talking about childhoods in early. Well, the rest of the world is that. In America, we keep our children babies way too long, mm. I think. Well, and I that's guess my some of us are babies too long also. Yeah, but that's my experience. When I go, when I went to Mexico when I was little, I saw a little boy. He couldn't have been more than six years old with a stick herding some cattle across a highway. I'm like, mommy, mommy. It was like something otherworldly. But children can have responsibility and they have to be told and they can't be kept in the dark. You don't want to terrorize them. You want them to have fantasy. Yes, let's read all those wonderful books. But at the same time, our children are growing up at a time where they need the truth. And they need to have knowledge. And talking about that, because yes. what happens at the loss of a pet? How do you help your child through that? We had to put our dog to sleep. Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter said, I said, oh, baby, Nisi had to go to dog heaven. And she said, why did, he, why did she have to go? I said, well, she didn't feel so good. And she was so weak and she couldn't walk. And then she asked me, but why did you let her go by herself? Ooh. Ooh. Mm. Wow. Okay, well, that's another book that has to be written. Shit. <laughs> 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 you said, okay. But I love that, like, you're lifting that up. And it also speaks to your commitment to mentorship, right, that you have had throughout your career and your work. Like, really, and, like, even this middle school, like, really recognizing that we need to have 
conversations with young people, not about all these different things, about feelings, about emotions, which we know, I know for, I grew up in spaces where there wasn't the language for that. People didn't talk about those things. We didn't have even the language, sometimes even the language of dance to kind of think, to understand that that was us trying to convey our, um, our feelings, our emotions. Like, why has it been so important for you with like, because you've lifted that up and carried that throughout your entire career. Like, tell us more about that mentorship piece in the school and that work. Well, you know what, I think it's because I grew up with a big family. I grew up with a grandmother who had birthed 10 children, mm -hmm. uncles and aunts, and there was a community. You know, my mother was, a, my mother is 99 this July, y'all. Wow. She is a poet and beautiful like Dorothy Dandridge. They were like, child, go fry some chicken and put that poetry down. So we grew up with a family of artists and teachers and community nurturing and also knew the struggle I had as a kid wanting to dance and not being allowed to because I was black. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't matter. It, you know, it wasn't happening. Mama tried to put me in that professional school. This is no black kids. She tried to pretend I was Mexican. They still wouldn't take me, you know. <laughs> it wasn't happening. So I know what dance did for me in the middle of segregation, racism. I saw things as a child that children shouldn't see. Mm -hmm. Horrors at like 12 years old that children should not see. That our children are watching on TV now. And I know what the dance did for me to help me believe in the universe and believe in a higher power and believe that I could soar and do anything that I wanted to. The dance gave me that. And so I know I have to give it to this next several generations as long as I can. It's a gift that my mother was the brilliant woman that she is, and she knew that her children needed the arts. Mm -hmm. And parents right now are strapped that can hardly give them food. So I have to raise money so I can pay for their classes, I can help them. Mm -hmm. So what would cost $500 might cost 75 or 50. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm doing. Yeah. And I know I'm watching my kids. I'm watching them. I've watched them for 20 years now. We're 22 years still standing. And yeah. that is a yeah. blessing. I call Dada my church. It is my church. It is a spiritual thing to do what we do. And I'm watching Kids that come to me, one kid, autistic, frightened, scared, couldn't go anywhere without his mother and his sister. I said, get out of the studio, give him to me. Mm. Took him, we have a, a piece in hot chocolate called the candy cane. It's where the boys, <laughs> hip hop, boom, boom. And I said, you're gonna learn this peep. And he was like, I said, you're gonna learn it now. <laughs> he learned it. Oh, I could cry, because he did it. And what was beautiful with the boys became his greatest protectors. Mm -hmm. Those boys that want to talk shit about everybody, they turned around and they embraced this mm -hmm. child mm -hmm. and they helped him get strong. And he did that number, oh, it was glorious. Mm -hmm. It was his autism that was holding him back, but we, the dance released him. Mm -hmm. And now he's doing great in school and he's gonna go to college and he's gonna do everything. And, and you know what, Ms. And Ms. Allen, you know, I, I was thinking that you said that, it's like, it's almost like it wasn't, it was the connection that gave him that power. The, like, the dance that gave him that power, right? Yes, and, and me even threatening his life. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> That too, that too. <laughs> that likely was a part of it. Well. Likely, probably part of it. Damn it, you're learning it now. Mama, stay out. <laughs> but also what I love about your ability to connect community and children and adults and elders and all these different people, I think a lot about Toni Morrison and yeah. the brilliance of her work and career. Yeah. And while she was writing her own work, she was also putting other authors on simultaneously yes. and I don't think of you any differently um, mm. because I know that you have spent a lot of time building your own career but in conjunction always with paving the way for someone else bringing the tribe I'm bringing the tribe <laughs> and when I think about that I know I personally know Chloe Arnold who is an incredible tap dancer um, who founded syncopated ladies it's an all-female dance troupe 
And I've watched over the many years your mentorship mm. of her and Maud. Yep. I've watched the different kinds of ways that you have created space, particularly for young black women, mm. to yeah. find their feet <laughs> and find their space yeah. and then stand in the spotlight with grace and dignity. One of the things that I'm most impressed by is you know, you're a legend, an icon, you're all the things, right? A working girl. But, <laughs> but and, when I look at your Twitter, yeah, you're always celebrating other people. Mm. That is very rare that you're like, here's what I did. In <laughs> fact, it's always talking about what someone else did, mm. right? Things that are maybe in the shadows that other people haven't seen. And I think there's something really gorgeous about being able to share space and pull yes. people into their rightful place. And I recognize that you come from this big family. And family. so I'm sure some of that was happening. People was like, get over there and do this and, and all, right? Yeah. But family. you had to figure out how to do that in your own way, in your own career, particularly in an industry that's not super interested in what black folks have to say, much like what you're saying about, I have a mind too. I have things that I'm thinking about. I'm not just dancing. And I'm curious about how you maintain the diligence and the balance between your own dynamic energy and always making space for others. Mm. Well, you know what? I'm not one that analyzes myself. I am expressionistic, which is a term I learned when I worked with Steven Spielberg, because he's very much like this. I'm in the moment. I have the ability to be present in the moment and deal with what this moment is or is not and what it should be. Yeah. I have the ability to do that. Uh, I was most versatile in my class in high school. Mm. So I've always been able to do a lot of different things. But I think my ability to actually see something very clearly and not be afraid to step in the middle of it, mm. not be afraid to step in the middle of it, to pull it up, get rid of it, straighten it out, do, fix things. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in a family with a lot of people, you know, you gotta make this one chicken work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the blessings that I have received, I mean, when you think about the people that have supported me, Barry Gordy gave us our first dollar. Barry Gordy, it was incredible. Wallace Annenberg, I'm telling you, we'd be on a respirator were it not for her. And now Shonda Rhimes and all the people in, in between, the board, all the people, all these people supporting. And it's not for me personally, it's for what I'm doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is for what I am doing that this is coming. And I have to recognize this is not me. There's not no eagle trip for me. It can say the Debbie Allen Dance Academy all day. I didn't even want to name it that when we started. I, I thought it was going to be Los Angeles. Something. They said, Debbie Allen Child, shut up. We need <laughs> your name. I said, OK, OK, you know. Um, it is for me to do this work. Mm. And this is me plowing, you know. That's something John Hope Franklin, I don't know if you know who he is. He's, oh, he was like, he was like our deep throat on Amistad. He came to the set because I needed Stephen to know he was supported by the black community. This was not a black white thing. This was history. This was truth. And John Hope came and was on them. Sat with him for several days, but he would always tell me this, and I say this in a lot of notes that I send to people. He said, Little Debbie, keep your hands on the plow. That's it. That's it. I love that. That's it. means work. That's it. Do the work. And my name, Deborah, which is my real name, Deborah, in Greek means little bee. And what are they? Workers. Workers. Wow. So I feel like, you know, from my mom, my sister, my dad, my family, I'm used to doing the work. My Uncle Ferdy, he was out, he was a farmer. He grew the sweetest corn and slopped those pigs and working, working. So. It is for us to do the work. Mm. There's a lot of praise that I've received. I said, child, they're getting ready to put me out to pasture. Did they give me one more award? What? Am I done now? What? 
I don't think so. I mean, all my friends, a lot of my friends home are child I'm a Deborah, come on and go on the jazz crew. I'm like, bitch, can't nobody go on no cruise. <laughs> I am working. <laughs> they are retired. In the hell? My husband looked at me the other night. He felt sorry for me because, you know, I was doing the finale of Grey's Anatomy. I was in it, directing it, trying to put together the dance thing, trying to do this, doing so many things, navigating the presentation for my musical theater students on, on April the, on, on June the 8th. I'm going to do an industry showcase for them. And then I have a recital. And then I have the summer intensive. And then I, you know, boo. And he just looked at me and he just touched my little head. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we kind of laughed because we talked about, it. you know, retirement just doesn't seem to be anywhere in there. I don't know. I think as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to want to do what I do in some capacity. It's important. It's why my mother is living to be 99. I say. I yeah, say. she's still telling me things. <laughs> <laughs> She'll tell me that. some truth that, ooh. Before we um, open up to some questions, I love that you want to work. You want to do the work. You want to be in the process. You're doing all the things simultaneously. Um, I'm equally curious about how you rest, how you recharge, how you okay. take care of yourself. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a little bit of a problem. I'm trying to address that because, like, while I was directing the finale, I'd wake up at 3.30 in the morning because that's the only time I could answer all these emails about the school and about the academy and everything. Then I'd try to get cute and go to work. Then I'd come home and my husband wants a grilled cheese. And then, you know, it starts again. So I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I like Chinese medicine and my Chinese doctor told me that I would live a long life if I, if I just took a nap every day. Just took a nap. So we're gonna put you on some nap therapy. Nap okay, therapy. Nap therapy. Just, <laughs> I heard a trick. You gotta lay down and put your feet up for 20 minutes, and that gives you an hour of rest. So I'm just saying, if you wanna try that this week. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna try I would be it. there for it, because I know you got it. a lot to do. I'm gonna do it. But we need you to take a nap. Sometimes. I need to take a nap, I really do. And there's so many books I wanna read, I can't even, get to them. I'll get to them maybe at some point. I'm, I'm supposed to be writing a book. I started, I wrote about 30 pages and child. <laughs> I still have, you know, I gotta find the time. It's time. You know, you don't get time back. That's why right. you can't waste it. Right. You don't get it back. Well, we are praying for some naps. Thank yes. you. And Nap the books energy. and Thank the you. shows. Okay. And all, the things. all right. But also praying for these naps. I know we got some questions, Yellow. Yeah, we want to open up the space. We have time for like two questions. And now, where's our folk? Leroy. Leroy, right there. Leroy's our training manager. Say hey to Leroy. Hey, Leroy. He is amazing. Leroy, um, we have to, we can take two questions briefly. Sorry, off the time. Okay, let's start right here. <laughs> you got it? Miss Debbie Allen, when you feel like you are losing that time, when you feel like there is a hurdle that you need to overcome, what is a mantra, what is an affirmation that you tell yourself to overcome? It's something my mother taught me. Be true, be beautiful, be free. Ooh. Be true, be beautiful, be free. Know your own world of being. Mm -hmm. Know your own world of being. I love that. Yes, yes wow. great question, thank you. Thank you for that great question. Yeah. I'm going to stand because you are indeed an icon. Oh. You are indeed an icon. Um, you are indeed an icon. I, can't just say it again. I just want to give a comment and then a question. Speaking about the things that we don't know about mental health and the turns and twists, these are things that Yellow and I have talked about before, but I'm a therapist and I found that the pursuit of licensure and being engaged in the Department of Mental Health and all of that work took me so far out of my healing nature. Mm that I found myself sitting with clients thinking, well, you and me both. We <laughs> okay. <laughs> now what now? <laughs> uh, and I have, and through long conversations, I made the conscious choice to step away from that pursuit. 
because I miss my ancestors. I miss the water. I miss the sage. I miss being a spiritual freak. And I am over-diagnosing you. I'm over-diagnosing you. My question, however, is, do you get back to Mexico ever? And if so, I'm considering living there. Oh. Any recommendation? Yeah, we got to get out of America. Mexico is amazing. <laughs> I went uh, maybe, um, was it a year ago? We went down to the Yucatan and walked the pyramids with my husband and my son. They have, they have these underground rivers that are really like a whole nother world. Um, Mexico is a, a place that I love. It gave me so much. When my own country didn't love me, they loved me there. Ooh. And I, I, I feel like I owe a lot. Uh, but the history there is still something that has to be excavated and, and understood. We still can't even decipher the hieroglyphics on all those pyramids. We don't know quite what it all means. Uh, we're getting closer. Um, but I, I love Mexico. I mean, the, the hard part over there is, you know, the cartels. You know, we're in a, in a world that, you know, back in the day it was slavery, today it's drugs. S you know, slavery was the illegal drug that they sold everywhere, and now it's drugs. So, there, but I wouldn't, I go whenever I can. This, I find peace there, and I'm always learning something. There are always interesting books to read and more people to talk to. Mexico is amazing. You just gotta find the right spot to be in. I feel like I feel I feel some naps in Mexico coming along, and I, I feel I'm, I'm feeling seeing, that seeing that seeing coming. You in Mexico, okay? Not working. That's with, all. With your feet I'm up, seeing. relaxing, enjoying Reading the yourself. the book that you have not had tequila, the opportunity tequila, to read. Tequila, tequila, tequila. Okay, with tequila. Come too. on, with some good tequila. That too. Okay. Miss Allen, it has been an absolute honor. It to is be able my to pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. Stand I up, give a round of applause for Miss Allen. I want to thank you all so much for this moment in the sun.